All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I'm excited to be with you. Most of the morning, guess where I wanted to be? In Australia in a van. <laughs> but what better setup to have Eliza come up here and have me start doing some of the things she was talking about. I feel much more calm. I want to talk to you today about rethinking what we think about leadership. And I want to do that by starting with a number that's been on my mind for a long, long time. $15.5 billion per year. Now what does this number represent? It represents how much money is spent in organizations in the United States on leadership, education, and development. It's not millions, it's billions. And actually, many consider that a very conservative number. They actually say it's probably near $50 billion per year in the United States spent on organizations, in organizations on leader development. And what I'm curious about is what do these organizations want for this monetary investment? What are they looking for? And so I've asked, and I get three primary responses. One of the most common is loyalty. By investing this kind of money in our people, we get loyalty. Our people stay because they feel we care about them and their growth and their development. The second common answer I get is performance. We found that as we invest in them in this way, they perform better. And as they perform better, the organization performs better. And our shareholders are happy. But by far the most common response I get when I ask organizations why they spend billions of dollars on their leaders is they want them to change. They want them to grow, develop, gain new skills, ability, or knowledge to change in some way. From where they are now in terms of how they perform to becoming something different. Now, they don't say we want them to change, but that's, if you listen to them and they describe in depth what they're looking for, that's what they want. I find that curious and stunning that we spend this much effort and money to help them change. The reason I find that fascinating is because we have a lot of research in psychology and social psychology that says that adults, not just leaders, adults are not very good at changing anything about themselves sustainably. So let me use health-related benefits that we might want to change or acquire in our lives as an example. The American Psychological Association reported recently that fewer than one in five adults, 16%, are able to change things that they want to change related to their health. I find that stunning. Let me give some examples. We'll take, for example, losing weight. People who want to lose weight that decide they want to lose weight, uh oh, there we go. Success rate in doing so, 20%. I like to reverse the number. The failure rate, 80%. <laughs> and these are people not being told they need to, they should, they must, they have to lose weight. These are people being told within themselves that they want to lose weight. Success rate, 20%. Let's take another one, starting an exercise program. Success rate, 15%. Failure rate, 85%. 85%. Let's take another. Uh, there we go, eating a healthier diet. Eating a healthier diet, success rate, 10%. Failure rate, 90%. And my favorite of all, I have yet to find a leader that says to me, I want, I need to reduce my stress. I want to reduce my stress. Success rate, 7%. Failure rate, 93%. Not good. Let's go back to that number. $50 billion a year on leader development. The monetary investment we want is leaders to change. The success rate in health-related areas, not good. Well, let's go back to leader development. What's the success rate of leaders changing? in sustainable ways, less than 10%. Failure rate? 90%. 90% failure rate. After what we call the honeymoon effect, which is you go to the program, you take the class, you have the help, and then you go back with some great ideas, you're excited to go back on Monday morning, put it into practice, you've got the binder they gave you, you're thrilled to make a difference. That's the honeymoon effect, the pep rally. What happens after that subsides? a 90% failure rate. 
Now, over 40 years ago, a colleague, friend, and co-author of mine, Richard Boyatza, set out to understand why don't adults successfully change who they are sustainably. Now, we're not interested in the lose the weight, gain the weight, lose the weight, gain the weight. That's not sustainable change. He set out to find out why do we struggle and when do we change sustainably when we do. I joined him almost 20 years ago in that same pursuit. And now we have other colleagues that have joined us. And we've learned some fascinating things about when we are successful as adults and as leaders in changing sustainably. Now, to give you a little background, in psychology and social psychology, we like to refer to the self using metaphors. For example, we'll talk about the real self or a current self, my strengths, my weaknesses, my values, my dreams, my personality traits. This is the current self, who I am today, the real self. We also talk about the ideal self. The ideal self is who I want to become or what I want to do in the future. It's internally driven, very tied to intrinsic motivation and positive emotion. We also talk about another metaphor, the ought self, O-U-G-H-T. This is the externally imposed self. What I ought to do, what I must do, what I should do based on the expectations of others. There's nothing wrong with the ought self, it's just another metaphor we use to describe who we are and how we make sense of our experience. Another self is the possible self. Thinking about possible ways in which I can become a better person. We're imagining possible selves. And then there's the provisional self. This is the self when I'm trying on new behaviors. I want to be more assertive, and so I'm practicing new ways of being assertive. I'm not assertive yet. I don't feel comfortable. That's not who the norm is of the current self, but I'm exploring new ways of being that. And so we call it the provisional self. When we started to look at adults and their attempts to change in sustainable ways, we found pervasively the focus is on the real self, who I am today. And what we think is if we show them a mirror and say, this is what you look like, strengths and weaknesses, warts and all, now change, that will get changed. Give constructive feedback or give them criticism, point out their weaknesses. Well, the reality is, although that's important that we get a sense of who we are currently and our capability, it's not enough to help us change sustainably. In fact, it often derails the efforts we make to change. And so about 15 years ago, Richard Boyatzis, my colleague, friend, and co-author, came up with a question that we started to ask leaders. And the question is, who's helped you become who you are today? Who's helped you the most? That's, there we go. Who's helped you the most to become who you are today? And for the last 15 years, Richard, Anita Howard, Bridget Rapisard, and myself, and now many others, have been all over the world asking leaders this question. Who's helped you the most? And we ask them to describe a specific person that's helped them become who they are today. And we found remarkable patterns in the stories leaders tell us or that they write about. And I want to share what we learned with you. But before I do, let me share what we didn't learn. We thought that we'd mostly hear about friends and family. We didn't. We heard stories about a math teacher I had in elementary school, a coach I had in college, a mentor I had in my first job. There was no pattern to the context people called up in describing people who help them become who they are today. We thought we would have stories about experiences that happened long ago. We didn't. There was no pattern to the recency in the stories. We heard stories that occurred 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and stories that occurred two weeks ago. We thought that maybe these people said something or did something that was profound, that had a lasting impact on helping them answer this question. We didn't find a pattern there either. Some of it was fleeting micro moments where somebody made a comment almost nonchalantly, and yet it had a profound effect on the individual. And we heard stories where someone did have a deep, profound discussion over time with someone. There was no pattern to the length of time, to the ways in which these things occurred. But we clearly did find patterns, overwhelmingly, all over the world. We've now asked hundreds of leaders this question. 
And after we ask them to think of a specific person that's helped them become who they are today, we then follow up with four additional questions, which I'll have you think about now. Who's helped you become who you are today? You wouldn't be who you are today without this person. Recall a specific moment. You may have had hundreds with this person. What did they say or do in that moment? How did it make you feel? And what did you take away? Those are the five questions. Now, to give an example of what we learned, let me share an example from my own life, from my daughter, Samantha. This is Samantha at four and a half. Now, she's not four and a half now, but I wanted to show you a picture of how old she was when this moment occurred in my own life. Samantha has helped me become who I am today. Cute little four and a half girl, year old girl. What happened is my wife was gone for the day and I was in charge of Team Taylor, our four children. Samantha is the second of our four children. And the entire day she was a drama queen. Fussy, whiny, too hot, too cold, too hungry, everything. And about 4.30 in the afternoon, I had had it. I was frustrated with her and I became impatient. I raised my voice and I said, Samantha, you go upstairs, put on your pajamas, brush your teeth, go to bed, no dinner for you. <laughs> she was obedient, she started to cry, but I heard her go upstairs, I heard her brush her teeth, open her chest of drawers, put on her pajamas. About 30 minutes later, I felt like a loser dad, I felt like I ought to go up and apologize. So I went upstairs and I found her sitting on the edge of her bed. So I kneeled down in front of her, now I'm looking up at her, about to give my epic father's apology for losing my patience and raising my voice. And before I could speak, and these were her exact words, let me give you some counsel. <laughs> <laughs> Pointing right at me. Let me give you some counsel. Like you, I was stunned. <laughs> My immediate thought was, here is a girl, four and a half, where does she get this? Let me give you some counsel. Have you been talking to your mother? <laughs> Let me give you some counsel. When I have a day like today, what you did is not helpful. Those were her exact words. Now he's even more stunned. And so for the second time, all I could mutter was, Okay. <laughs> then she said, what will be helpful is if you walk, if you come up to me and give me a hug instead. For the third time I said, okay. And then she said, her exact words, will you do that? And I said, okay. I gave her a hug. I said, let's go downstairs and get you some dinner. And then the second epiphany, if you will, occurred. This girl completely believes I can do what she's asking. At four and a half, somehow in her mind, she has no doubt whatsoever I can be that kind of dad. Now, how did I feel in that moment? I felt consumed to be that kind of father. Not because she just wanted me to be, I wanted to be that kind of dad. I wanted to be the dad that wouldn't raise his voice, but would give her a hug instead. I was consumed with that desire. In fact, I hoped she would have another bad day soon so I could be that kind of dad. <laughs> the second thing that occurred is by the time we got to the kitchen, I believed her. I believed that I had that capability. I didn't need a 10-year patience project to help me develop incrementally into becoming that kind of dad. I had it within me. She believed I did, and I believed I did. What does this story represent? It represents what we have found from hundreds of leaders in 80 or more percent of the stories they've told us, depending on the sample. My own experience over the last 15 years is that 90% of the stories leaders have told me in response to the question, who's helped you the most, are identical to what Samantha's story teaches us. They don't teach us about helping fix people by pointing out their weaknesses or giving them an agenda of things they should practice. What story, Samantha's story represents is people helping us to see what we call in psychology our ideal self. 
In fact, Richard and his colleagues wrote up the study that we did, and they said, our ideal self is our noble passion in life, our dreams, our images of a desired future. It's supported by the belief that we can make a difference. And what we found repeated over and over in these stories is leaders telling us that someone helped them see their ideal self or their strengths, what they're good at. Now let's be clear. Who we are today is the result of a series of changes that have occurred over time. You wouldn't be who you are without the changes that have occurred. And they are sustainable because they're your current or your real self. And what our research has found is that the best way to help people do that is to tap into their dreams, their passions, their aspirations. Why? Because when we hook up people to fMRI machines and ask them to describe aspects of their ideal self or what they think they're good at, generally what they think they're good at, a network in their brain called the default mode network is activated. And that network is, is connected to prosocial behavior positive emotion, openness and receptivity, innovation and creativity. Very different than what happens when we have conversations about the real self. We also found that people are more excited to venture and try new things as a result. And so when we lead with the ideal self in the change process, even when we're giving constructive feedback, if this is the focus of the feedback and why we're helping them connect to this through the feedback, they're more likely to sustain the change. As they're practicing new behaviors, they're doing it with this as the purpose in mind. It leads the change process. Now, I want you to think about people that you care about, that you have a relationship of trust. TED is about not just ideas and not just the pep rally or the honeymoon, but about change. The best thing you can do to help them initiate their own self-directed, sustained change is have a conversation with them about their strengths. Let them know what you think they're good at and share it with them. And the second thing I would suggest is homework assignment to you, because professors give homework, <laughs> is I would invite you to help them through discussion with you to discover their dreams. Not your dream for them, but discover their dreams, their ideal self. And when you do that, you're starting to help them change by their own self-directed efforts in sustainable ways. You've been wonderful. Thank you.